All right, folks, let's get started. <clears throat> Welcome to the eighth installment of the smartest people in the room. I am thrilled to be broadcasting my portion of this from the Mother Church, the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville, Tennessee. The historic Ryman Auditorium is hallowed ground. It's where Johnny met June and where Bluegrass was born. The Ryman opened in 1892 as a non-denominational church and has been hosting events spanning every genre since the 1920s. Before the COVID-19 shutdown, the venue typically held 300 events per year. Earlier this year, Polestar Magazine awarded the Ryman Theater of the Year for the 10th consecutive time and the 12th time overall. No other theater can come close to matching that track record of success. For fans and artists alike, you simply cannot beat the Ryman as the best place to play or catch a show, period. And we are spoiled rotten to have it located right here in Music City. Guests can experience 128 years of inspiration and strength of the iconic Nashville landmark. The Ryman Museum is open for tours every Tuesday through Sunday. Visit ryman.com for more info. And as you can see, it is open for business behind me. You see people milling around, they're taking the tour. So come on out and enjoy it. Before we get started, let me take care of some business. I wanna thank all of our sponsors. <clears throat> First Horizon Bank, Bufkin Baker, Four Roses Bourbon, Fairlane Hotel, Core Power Yoga, Tennessee Entertainment Commission, Lightning 100, Tennessee Brew Works, Moo TV, Jive Printing, Project Music, and also Organics. So let's get the party started. For anyone who works in the music industry, these two guys probably need no introduction. In fact, these two are so well known that they qualify to be recognized by single names Geiger and left sets. If you say either one of those words, music industry people know exactly who you are talking about. Today, we are so pleased to welcome back Bob left sets to our stage as the interviewer. Bob is the music industry's most important, widely read and influential spokesperson and blogger. He's most well known for the left sets letter, an industry wide newsletter that you should subscribe to for free. Bob's industry commentary can also be heard via the Bob Left Sets podcast, and Sirius XM's volume 106. Never boring, always entertaining, his insights are fueled by his stint as, the entertainment business, as an entertainment business attorney, major domo of Sanctuary Music's American division, and consultancies to major labels. Bob's guest today is Mark Geiger. Until about a month ago, Mark Geiger was worldwide head of music for William Morris Endeavor. In his position, Geiger oversaw strategy and operations for the world's largest music booking agency. In 2018, Geiger's team of 200 agents booked over 35,000 dates for artists across every musical genre, including pop, hip hop, rock, and electronic music. WNE's artists accounted for more Grammy winners than any other agency in 2018. Additionally, Geiger has represented some of the world's most critically acclaimed artists, including David Byrne, Depeche Mode, Neil Diamond, Jane's Addiction, LCD Sound System, Steve Martin, Janelle Monet, Nine Inch Nails, Outkast, Pixies, Trent Reznor, Rihanna, Lindsey Sterling, The Flaming Lips, Trans-Siberian Orchestra, Tom Waits, Jack White, and Tom <laughs> I love That's that. Yeah. <laughs> Silent. Yeah. No problem. Geiger be began his career as a concert promoter and worked as an agent at Triad Artists. He also, he co-founded Lollapalooza. Geiger was hired by Rick Rubin and appointed executive vice president of A&R Marketing and New Media at American Recordings. In 1994, Geiger recognized the internet's enormous potential to provide a link between artists and consumers and launched Artist Direct. The site went on to become a media juggernaut housing a talent agency, two record labels, a marketing solutions division, and one of the most popular music destinations on the early internet. <clears throat> he served as the company's chairman and CEO before joining William Morris in 2003. Consistently recognized for his ability to forecast trends in the music industry, Geiger has been included on Billboard's power list and Variety's list of top talent agencies, agent executives regularly. Please welcome Mark and Bob into the smartest people into the room. Okay, for those who don't know, I'm recording this for a potential podcast, so I'm going to start the podcast intro, which won't last long. 
Welcome, welcome, welcome back to the Bob Left Sets podcast. My guest today is Mark Geiger, formerly head of music at WME, all-around music seer. Mark, good to have you. Hi, Bob. Okay, drive-in concerts, gimmick or real? Gimmick. Tell me a little bit more. Why is it a gimmick? Do I have to? <laughs> I mean, um, why is it a gimmick? Capacity is very small by the time you actually put the cars in. Um, pricing with a disconnected experience is high. The audio, I don't think, can be very good yet in the car, but hey, um, these are temporary stopgap solutions. So for me, economically, they don't scale. Garth did a very interesting thing basically with a pay-per-view, right, to other drive-ins. I think there's a feeling <clears throat> that what I call, during the, what I call the germophobia economy, that almost anything will sell because there's everybody's dying to get out of the house. So for me, it's not really a, a great experience, to be honest. Well, that begs the question, uh, when- And the economics I... are broken, so let's, you know, right. let's get real. People are doing things to do them, not to make a living, right? So when do you think concerts return? My guess is late 21, more likely 22. I think that this is going to be, look, the whole thing's a shit show. <laughs> you write about it, everybody knows, whether it's testing, organizing government, that just, let's not, it's too infinite of a well to go down. But in my humble opinion, it's going to be 22. Um, it's going to take that long for what I call the germophobia economy to be slowly killed off and be replaced by what I call the claustrophobia economy, which is everybody wants to get out and go back to dinner and have their life and go to festivals, go to shows. And my instinct is that's just going to take a while because as you can see, these super spreader events, sports, shows, festival, anything, classroom, ain't going to do too well and it, while, the, uh, while the virus is this present. So my, my instinct is the world has a very long forced time out. A lot of people see the positives in it, um, whether it's climate, whether it's pollution, whether it's traffic, whether it's nature, whether it's animals, whether it's our own beings and taking a pause. Um, and I know it's frustrating, maddening, and um, economically you know, destructive, but ah! Uh, you know, this is bigger than us. And if you study history, things like this have happened in history and been super disruptive to normal society. So here's a biggie for our lifetime. Let's go drill down for those people who are not experts like you. To what degree is insurance and liability a factor in restarting? Well, there is no insurance against COVID currently offered. And even <clears throat> normal insurance policies are pretty scarce and hard to come by the insurers are sitting on the sideline because there's infinite liability i don't know what's tested not tested lawsuit hey i got COVID at this event how do you prove it etc i think the biggest companies can maybe self-insure um and they can start everybody else has to wait till the insurance industry feels good so that's one of many many roadblocks in the way of restarting this vibrant economy that got put down right so there's probably 20 of them when you drill into why can't you, the virus and the illness being one, you know, all the spacing, the density. Insurance is a biggie. And um, I don't know when that comes back either. Now, needless to say, you're no longer with WME, but uh, certainly there's no live business, I meaning there's no income for agents and agencies they work for. What we've learned over the past week is a lot of these touring entities got money. The Eagles got money for the road business, et cetera. Question I'm asking is to what degree will sitting on the sidelines for two years affect the economics of the industry? Can these companies survive? Michael Rapino says he can borrow money. There's no, not an issue, but being in the heart of an agency, can these agencies and these other support elements survive two years off? Look, um, no matter what anybody says, it's economically devastating, okay? So I recognize that, and I don't think any excuse um, can be made, and there will be a huge amount. If I'm right on the timetable, right, there's going to be a massive amount of bloodshed and bankruptcies, and it will not be good for the majority of the industry. I think Michael Rapino's right. You know, he's 
he's big. He has great backing. People want to buy his stock. Um, he's got Liberty. He has a great business when it comes back. So you can borrow against that. And it's not a great outcome, but your question is, can they survive? I think people who have access to really good financing credit facilities can definitely survive, right? And I know the costs of carrying over some of these businesses. Agencies are actually relatively cheap. Michael Rapino has got a much bigger issue and a much bigger staff. The biggest agencies are, again, <clears throat> cheap is a relative word, right? But if something's gonna cost 50 or $100 million to bridge for a moment, um, again, that sounds huge, but in today's world, when you have access to capital, you can borrow against that for a year or two. And the businesses were quite profitable and they can pay down the debt service. It, it's a short-term mortgage. Okay. And when it does come back, how does the landscape change? Whew. $20 billion question. I, I, I mean, I guess let me be specific. At I, first. I think Bob, that's a really tough question to answer. I think if the, if we're in the second or third inning of the ball game of destruction, um, I, I don't know what the game looks like at the end. I, I think the next six months may be more painful than the last batch. And maybe the next six months after that might be even more so. So I think one of the things that happened for me after leaving was um, I was able to look at the pandemic two ways. I was overseeing or part of a team of, industry people who oversee, oversaw this destruction, this cancellation, postponement, et cetera, et cetera, tried to have order out of it, but was sort of trapped in that viewpoint. Um, now I get to look at COVID as a bit of an opportunity, but the question of where to exactly look and who's not going to make it and who's going to be under distress, you start bottom up, small people with no access to capital, people of high overheads, people who have staff that they can't easily go into shutdown mode, on, they're going to get eviscerated and they're going to need help. Um, I just, think just for one second, those people in the, back the audience right. about live touring and how artists can make money outside of touring. So you all, you all carry okay. on. We'll, we'll, yeah, we'll get to that. So in any event, recapping here, Mark, you said, uh, when we look at the future, we're talking from the bottom up. Well, uh, people at the bottom are squeezed for capital. Please continue. I think that Again, people with infrastructure and more overhead and lack of access to capital, it's a perfect storm for them. Um, when you start talking about the big companies of Live Nation 8G, CTS, Ocesa and others, they have access to facilities and credit and debt facilities. They're public companies. The investors, a lot of investors look at them as value because they think, Ooh, when the claustrophobia economy kicks in and the world restarts, everybody's going to want to be per participate in these companies will be in a good position to take advantage of it. So I believe that is going to rule the day and people will make smart investments into businesses. They think they'll come back, but the bigger, the better there. If you're small, if you're medium sized, it's going to be tricky. If you know, like Neva, the organization who represents is a trade organization for the clubs is trying to appeal to the government for money for obviously a, a loan to, or a grant to the club. Today, um, the economic devastation is going to be bigger than people think. The reshaping is going to be bigger than people think. And we all have to watch and conserve our capital and just take a pause and try obviously not spend just to get to the other side. I know that sounds very basic, but I think it's true. Question becomes, when we come out the other side, do the big get bigger? It depends how they act. They can. I mean, they have to get smaller to reduce overhead. But, you know, people with real access to capital, again, if you think about it like a bigger version of 2008 in the real estate crash, if you owned a bunch of office buildings or apartment buildings or hotels or houses and you had to sell them or you had a cash crunch, you were screwed, right? You were on the bad side. If you were a real estate fund or private equity, you're 100 billion in cash or 10 billion in cash, and you waited till all the foreclosures showed up on your street, which we all saw, and you could swoop in. It was an unprecedented opportunity. Um, certain banks and others made a fortune during that time. So I think it's how you look at the world and if you have access to capital. And I, but I do, th I do think there'll be a lot of different owners uh, 
and people who have equity in the music business infrastructure when you come out of this. Well, liberty is capped in terms of how much they can own of Live Nation. But if we look mm -hmm. historically, in 2008, uh, they invested in Sirius and ended up with control of that company. So staying on this same tip, we grew up in the pre-internet era where you were a band, you started in clubs, you worked your way up. And in addition, the record company supported the clubs. Let's talk about what that was like prior to this crisis. Um, okay, Wh which part do you want me to start? My question with? is, is that paradigm broken? No, what do I we think it's more important than ever. I think that there's, just because the world switched to streaming and there's a different distribution system. Artist development's not that different. You have more tools, all right? You have more connectivity. You have more ability to be global. You <clears throat> use multiple platforms to communicate with your audience and your music can get distributed better. You're not held out of a record store. But the development process is the same. The touring, the press. Yeah, the, but, it, but, but as I say, if we go back to the club clubs era. Clubs are critical. Yeah, they're more, the club, they're more packed the, today than they were back in our club era by a lot. But are there as many? Yeah, there's more. Many more clubs. Music has infinitely more genres than the period you're talking about, right? Popular genres. Kids have much more access. Kids, everybody has much more access to music. And so music is thriving. Um, you know, you can argue long tail, but from a genre standpoint, you have much more access. They're much deeper. I mean, the electronic nightclubs alone outnumbered the amount of rock clubs than in total when we were growing up. So I think it's a, a um, and globally, um, there's a ton more. So I, I think the supply is up and the demand is up. Um, which ones last, how they get transformed, that's all a big question. But yeah, I, I think the development process is healthier than ever and bigger than ever. And by the way, the upside's bigger than ever. It's just, there's more noise. It's a signal noise, right? There's, a, there's how many new releases. Remember what was, Back in the era you were talking about, there was only X amount of music that could come out. That's dwarfed in a week. Okay, let, let's go to this specific issue. Yep. A, when you're working at William Morris, would you sign an act? Let's assume the re act had no record recording representation of any significance. Would you sign an act that did not have a live head, uh, you know, could not sell tickets by themselves already. Of course. So how would you break an act like that? Uh, I, okay. You breaking an act would imply that we were that powerful. You know, we're just team member, subcontractor on the team of building a house. That's the way I look at it. All right. From any position. All right. So part of it is how well is the team and the people work together? How great is the manager? Obviously how great is the artist? How great is the music? Um, listen, when you, sign an, an artist if you really love them and you believe in them. <clears throat> it's not about breaking them in a record. It's about laying a base so they grow. If they happen to break, they break. The industry wants its you know, immediacy and its stadium this and so and so that and it's pop metaphor. I typically, you know, my taste is outside pop metaphor. So uh, you don't have a choice. You're five, 10 years to grow and break artists over time, especially depending on how they, um, how they record and how frequently. So part of it is pack tour packaging. Part of it is festivals. Part of it is getting great publicists. Part of it is calling in favors if you can to whoever it might be that can promote, stream, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, if you have that kind of leverage and, and, and hope that others are making the same calls. From our standpoint, when you are on the agency, and by the way, you work well with the manager and the manager, had, you know, how, how's their social media? How are they on, are they, are they frequent? posters? Are they infrequent posters? Is it, are they creating content more frequently than the others? A lot of what changed was the ability to post content in different places and different types. So if you are not an artist that generates a lot of content, you are at a significant disadvantage in the digital area. If you were somebody who could post a lot of content, assuming you didn't turn it into a commodity, you had a big advantage. So, you know, it's all different and you have to look at every artist, genre, level of interest, critical acclaim, <clears throat> Uh, all of it and create a custom strategy, just like, you know, a good um, tutor or teacher does for a student. They're all individuals. So 
part of it is can you get other artists to love them and recognize what you love about them and and champion them there's a a, a lady i signed before before i left called jensen mccray and she is my favorite she's Joni mitchell meets tracy chapman and i think she's absolutely spectacular a couple of songs on spotify the albums should be best new album best new artist on the grammys um she's a social media monster and she's hyper genius so she's very different than some of the other people who don't post they're not political they're not trying to build an audience that way and her music is more viral than others so i think there's a lot to all of this and it's very custom and there is no one what we have now is an open system like technology where everything can an app can be made for any platform because there are open systems now leave apple out of this for a minute um generally open systems i think music's the same and so people who create more content and know how to communicate with their audience do a little better but that was part of the job was make giving them opportunities getting the right slot on coachella Lollapalooza, this festival that festival this opening slot this so and so this right night it, it, it's all of it and if you do it all right you know people think you do well but that's what can I tell okay, you? So speaking of the signal to noise, it also yep. applies on the agency level. There are more people making music, more people looking for your time and your abilities to work with them. To How does someone reach you or W when you worked at, or an agent at WME? Or do they have to be involved with someone who knows you because there's just too much product? You know, it's an interesting thing. First of all, everybody's reachable because... I'm pretty easy to get to as are most people out there. If you try, if you don't know anybody and don't can't figure an email address or where to post or what to do, I, I understand that. But I do think when you look at things that are incoming, you have a lower hit rate than when you look at things when you're proactive. So let's call them reactive. I get 20 million artists coming at, well, there's WME in the old, in, you know, in my past or any other agency or any other label or, I'm trolling blogs, critical list, all music guide, consequences, sound, stereo gun, whatever it might be. Other filters that I trust and I proactively go after the records, all right, or the, the artists. That's the difference between an 80% success rate and a 10% success rate. So a lot of the time you don't want the incoming, even though that story sounds good. Hey, somebody got to me, they were fantastic, whatever. <clears throat> and um, I think that the bottom line is to try to prioritize your trusted filters over just incoming noise would be what I, how I'd answer that question. So I didn't care that much about that. It's kind of like you, by the way, you're the one who writes, Hey, if you pitch me on a record, I'll never play it. And then no, 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 I have no, to read no, no. every, wait, every three letters is some random rant on a record you discovered. And you wouldn't write it if I told you to listen to it. You wouldn't. Uh, uh, yeah, absolutely, man. But so, there's so much incoming, it affects the business. There you go. On so many levels. Since you were in a different vertical than I am, I, that's why I asked. Same shit. You know what the truth is? I, we had to process more than you did. You could be more selective because what you did, we had to process hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of artists and try and make intelligent decisions, whoever you are in any business, thousands. And um, what can I say? You, you try to make, you try to narrow down your decisions over time and get more fine in your filtering. Well, it's generally, you know, you know, I would say this is 99.9%. I don't respond to email from people I do not know unless they're famous yep. uh, because 10% of the public is literally insane and you yep. don't know what 10% it is. Have you had that issue where there are people who are relentless and cause problem for you? Yeah, but who cares? It, it, what, it, yes, but that's few people, you know, you didn't listen to my music. You don't know what you're talking about. It's so you get judged on, ultimately you get judged on the artists you work with not the failed attempts and the who wanted to get into the party and you didn't sign them. It's, did you find, were you able to identify good artists? Could you grow them and develop them? Did others on your team do the same? Could you be collaborative? Could you figure out more intelligent filtering systems? Could you figure out more intelligent marketing promotion systems or whatever it is, or artist development systems in our case? 
So, you know, that's what it is. By the way, Deborah Newman, Southside did a great one, and it was great for New Jersey. They're just one-offs. But even though they're successful, sorry, I'm reading the chat. Hi, Kate's. Love you. Okay, now in the old days, pre-internet days, a yep. developing act would bo essentially borrow money from the record company to stay alive until hopefully they broke. Yep. How do, you, how do you do it today if there's no record company involvement? Well, here's the good news. In the old days, you needed a record company. Today, you don't, right? I mean, you know that. You write about it all the time. Of course. So you, okay, so there's now, in the old days, there were two ways to get on the freeway, right? Record company or you had to be a loud indie, right? And even the indies developed over time, but they had them, right? Back in the pop days, you could have VJ, you could have this, you could have that. Concord, Rounder, Sub Pop, et cetera. Matadors, there were many, many of them. You, those were your two on-ramps and the rest of the time you were kind of in the demo bin. Nowadays, there are multiple platforms from all the way up to Spotify, New Orleans program from SoundCloud, da, 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 and you can break on TikTok or something, all right? So you have options, didn't have them before. You also have scale options, global scale options. You also have CRM, CRM technical term for identifying your audience and figuring out how to keep them, right? And keep them interested. And that is what record companies tried to do without the actual communication directly with an individual. So you can be a record company and there's a billion indies. So the options are dramatically different. It's back to how great is your art? How does it cut through? You know, is it Jensen McRae, one listen, holy shit, or is it something else, right? Um, and I think it's how intelligent, can, how can you act given the new tool set? Well, I'm talking specifically about cash. You go okay, out, cash. frequently cash. it's, a, it's okay. a losing proposition. You make a bunch of videos, you get some traffic, you get viral, you get some AdSense from YouTube, and you know, people are, if you read about it, you can make money that way, you could. Yeah, you need a money. lot of views. I, 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 I understand, my point is that there is ad revenue. There didn't used to be, okay, ever. There is ad revenue across a bunch of platforms if you can generate traffic. If you were, look, Bob, I cannot answer you to tell you that all the, two trillion artists who want to make it in this world are going to make money. They're not. That's not how the system works. Okay. No matter what system and no matter how open it is, there's a bunch that get through, have traffic listeners and fans that make money from the bottom of the pyramid. Let, not let me, let me be very specific. Okay, good. In all these days, yep. you put a band on the road, they need a van, they might need hotel rooms and yep. usually they still do. And usually there was shortfall. In the old days, it was the label, assuming there was a label or the manager. If there is not a label, is it still the manager who's taking care of that shortfall? Necessity is the mother of invention. I know a lot of artists who sleep on couches, who make phone calls, who work the networks. I was talking to Jim Lucchese, who came out of Spotify and his so far sounds, they do shows in people's living rooms. People just scale down. They release oh. records, they put it on Bandcamp, they sell 20 records at $10 each, and okay, so they, they, make, find, they, they make do, and they make is, do okay, with the so cost they this. have like everybody else. You can okay, create they, it home too, which they you find couldn't used way. to. But yeah, if you they talk, find a way. If you talk to people who sell clubs, and of course, clubs have been redefined. It used to be really under 400, but now, you know, you have the Wiltern that is 1500. But if you talk to acts that consistently go clean in those venues, they are bitching ad infinitum about the ticket master fee and they can't make money. Needless to say, on the other end, the stars dictate. Are they bitching and do they have a legitimate point that they cannot make enough in these buildings and they cannot keep ticket prices low? Or are they just, you know, wankers who were complaining hold on are you saying the bands are to or live nation at this relates to the wiltern and and you confused me so the capacity is 2200 no 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 let's not make that specific let's just okay. talk under 500 capacity no look ticket fees you know what they are you write about them all right right uh most people most artists don't get ticket rebates. That's wrong. You write about it all the time. You write about the top few people who are, have that kind of leverage and clout and, you know, or grandfather deals. Most people don't get them. I can tell you that. Right. And I know that world. Well, <clears throat> they don't, they don't. So 
it's not the artist dictating ticket fees. Ticketing was a profit center for a promoter that, or all promoters, frankly, all promoters, they were lifelines, not just the big ones, took advances from, et cetera, because in an 85, 15, 90, 10 world with no downside, promoters can't make money, <laughs> okay? They can't, it's not a fair fight. So the reality is a little different than you write, okay? Because it, it, there's a sensationalism. Um, no, side. no, I agree Wait, with that. Hold, hold, hold on, Okay. Finish. You know, you talk about the big people who are able to get a ticket rebate here and there that for the most part, okay, 98%. There weren't rebates and ticketing is what helped promoting companies grow as sad as it sounds. So in an all in ticket, it might be a more fair economic percentage. And that for whatever reason, people don't want an all in ticket because the artist then thinks ticket price too high, whatever. Okay. This will find its feet at the end of the day, no matter what anybody says, there were more tickets selling in 2019 and there were going to be in 2020 as a record year than ever before in history by a lot. So the ticketing fees as however you feel about them, and obviously I'm trying to answer you in a political let fashion. Let me be very wait, clear. Wait, wait. Didn't okay, let's affect just talk about, consumption. They no, didn't. But let's talk about venues that are under 500, which is a good okay. There are acts that consistently sell those. They say we mm -hmm. want to sell the ticket for 25, it's yeah. 40, and we're not making enough money. Once that's you go true. beyond Listen, that's that. True. that. That's true, and they have to negotiate a, a reduced ticketing deal, which is possible, especially if you have good connections, you can do it. If you can't, you might be a little screwed. There's some truth there. Okay. So let's go to the future. What yep. do we know? Which you, which you illuminated, which essentially is the acts take all the revenue and therefore the promoter and the biggest promoters you talk to them. Yes, they make their money on the ticketing. But, but also let's get real. The acts, <laughs> again, I'm not taking the pro artist, pro anything here. I'll just try to be a realist. The artists have expenses. Forget commissions. Yeah, right? yeah, that's, you not know. Even, that's, okay, not wait. Even my, that's not even my question. But just be aware. I'm not trying to say we're mobile they're armies. Doing. Okay, go ahead. No. Listen, if the promoter wasn't make money, you know, Live Nation would be out of business. Exactly. My, question, my question becomes when it comes back, yep. already the promoters are trying to lower the percentages. They're trying to make deals that more add to themselves. Of course. Do you, do you think those will stick? I think, look, I, I don't want to be a prognosticator. My instinct is, is that the artists and their representatives have always had the leverage and they exact it in, in, as balanced as they can be, okay? So I don't think any of this stuff lasts. To be fair to promoters, to have additional risk when people are trying to reschedule dates, when you may be rescheduling till next May, which is going to get canceled, okay, or whatever. And the promoter can't get insurance and has to hire more doctors, temperature checks, and all the other crap they have to put up with, let alone that they don't know which mayor, governor, county official will say you can only sell half the people, half the capacity, and they're supposed to be on the hook for a guarantee is insane, all right? I mean, just insane. The risk is infinite. So promoters are absolutely not wrong. They should say everybody should share the risk. We don't know what the future's like, certainly in the immediate short term, right? And everybody does need to pitch in. Um, and I think for the most part, before I got, uh, before I uh, exited, um, most people were, and most people, when you really think about how much risk the promoter does carry and what they have to deal with, and the lack of food and beverage or sponsorship and all the things that canceled out of any of these people's lives from an ancillary revenue standpoint, they're getting pounded. So to just think, oh, they should bridge their companies and then they should make minus minus dollars isn't really fair. So that was sort of in my two cents, what, what I would say back to you. I think it is needed in the short term, like any help is needed for anybody, whether it's governmental assistance or whatever, talent fees are high and, and they'll find their way back. It's like the stock market, you know, it goes way up, then it goes back down, then it crawls back up. It goes back down. And if you're an investor, you're kind of used to it. And I think artists will have to play that way. And I, I, not every artist, remember, this is too easy of an argument because not every artist sells the same amount of tickets and means the same gross. So there's levels of risk just of promoting artists in general. Okay, and maybe if the overall market's down 20%, 
and half the artists sold 60%, now they're down 40%, you know, they're maybe down to 40% or something like that. And so the promoter has to deal with that too. I don't think it's going let's to be go all new capital. Sorry. Let's, let's go back to the agent. Used to okay. be for historically, the agent got a straight 10%. <laughs> Assuming you have an agent, the people who can go clean, the people selling the big buildings are not paying 10%. So give us the landscape there. Well, listen, 10% business is different if you're in theater, books, acting, film, television, et cetera. Let, let's, we're uh, only talking about music. I got it, but I want to explain it because it's important for people to realize it's about effective margin, okay? And I tried to explain this to a lot of people in Hollywood, so they understood it because a lot of people in Hollywood felt that music people were disruptive and disrespectful of the commission system, which is not true. It is totally different, okay? If you're a director or an artist, you get, or an actor or whatever it is, writer, you get paid your fee and you pay either an attorney uh, or, or an agent or both. And you keep roughly 85, 90% of the haul. If you're an artist and you get a gig, you may be 30, 35, 25, 20 to 35%, maybe 40 of the net. Okay. That's your net of a guarantee. So commission off the top, which is a gross number, is a big number to that. It can vary the net by a good amount. And when you have million dollar guarantees or higher, commissions can be very high at 10%. So there's been a natural arc, I should say, um, over time in the music industry because of this. And arc is, as the artist gets bigger, they, they pay less commission, right? And they make it a more digestible piece of their fee structure. And I think they do that with a lot of the professionals on their team as they have more leverage. And I think that's historic. Okay, when you get to the level where you're making a touring deal with yep. Rapino, and certainly Rapino or Concerts West under AG want to do that, mm -hmm. why does an act need an agent? Oh, by the way, did want to do that right now. <laughs> you know, questionable. <laughs> you say, hang on, you're, you're the one who mentioned that they have all this money out. Yeah, I'm sure they would like to have a lot of it back right now and keep some employees uh, and some other infrastructure versus having it sitting in an artist bank account that can't be recouped at the moment. So that will find its, its day two, right? And <laughs> who has that much advanced capital and sitting out and for how long and da, 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 da. All right, back to your question, because I, I took a side road. Okay. So what were you saying? It was the agencies. Is, da, 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 the, the question is, if you're making a touring deal with Live Nation, just simplify yep. that. Why do you need an agent? A lot of people don't. A lot of a lot of the lot of the managers do those deals directly, um, and look, there's a whole bunch of reasons. Uh, <laughs> you don't know what you don't know, so are you paying for professional advice? Are you paying for people that know the market? Why don't people list their houses more on their own? Tell me why it's cost five to 7% or whatever it is. Do they think they know the price? Do they think they know the deals? Do they know the comps? Do they know how to do it? Um, can they market? Can they get? Well, that, no, that's right, so, wait, wait, hang, on, hang on. No, no, no. These are specific answers to the right. same thing in music. And can they get on that festival? Oh, they make a deal with Rapino and now they want to play Glastonbury or they want to play Coachella and that's AEG. Then well, how do you manage? all of that stuff, right? Um, and the truth is there's loyalty in this. People grow bands from inception and here's a big deal and you're gonna cut people out. There, there's a lot in this. It's not one answer, right? Sometimes when it, whether it's reading your articles or other um, people's take on the industry, it's very simple in black and white. And I don't think any of these answers are, okay? Because there are millions of artists or at least tens and tens of thousands and they're all different. So I would say you should, if you ask 10 managers that question, they would give you 10 different answers, including I don't need an agent or I would only pay them a reduced amount or you know what, they deserved it and they earned it. Or I think they got me double the money or they got rid of an earn out provision in the deal that would have lengthened, you know, wouldn't make it a finite deal. There's a lot of answers there. Okay. Or, they, or you know what? I don't need to pay them on this, but the private corporates and the college gigs or the fair dates or the festivals outside of so-and-so are worth so much to me. And that's where I make the money. I'll pay them a reduced on this. Again, it's, there's a lot of answers here. Okay. Let's say you're an act. Uh, a lot of these festivals have three to five stages. 
if an act plays at, at two in the if, if they play at two in the afternoon, other than saying I played that gig, okay, I played Lollapalooza, is there a benefit to them? Can they break? I think so. I mean, listen, I've said for years <clears throat> and made it a real point to say festivals are the new record stores. All right, when those po when that gets announced, most people that are going and others because they're such a massive cultural force. Go do research like you would up anything back in the day, all right, on all the people playing the festival, including who knows what band, what artist, what friend of theirs, who, why are they not know that band, they're not hip enough. And so there, there's a hasten discovery process on the announce. Then the app comes out and you're making your schedule of where to go and what to do. And you're basically continually sifting through a lineup, whether it's 100x, 50x, 150x. And you are making choices and you're in it okay it's like what party do i go to it's like your school um day all right what classes do i take and where do i go and when's my lunch so i think festivals are infinitely more than that and i think the one o'clock and two o'clock slots i've <laughs> i've been involved with 50 acts that have break, broken starting there in fact as it relates to signal to noise bob if you have a big show at two in the afternoon you own that period of you course. know, by seven, the whole festival's rocking and you don't, you might not make a sound, right? So I'm not sure it's a disadvantage. We've purposely put artists in the old days early in the slots to avoid competition. So they got all the attention. Amy Winehouse is four o'clock on purpose. Okay, let's, to what degree, you've talked about this over the last 15 years or so, expanding the purview of the agency into advances, into promotion of concerts. Are these venues that agencies will continue to forage in, or will they ultimately just be arbiters of gigs? Listen, I, I can't, I don't want to tell you what other people are going to do moving forward post-COVID. What I would tell you is the market's gonna get pummeled. And when that happens, typically things can be more formless and opportunity drives and nobody's gonna be worrying about regulation at the moment, you know, if not for years until this thing comes back. So the answer really is where do people see opportunities and where are they willing to go and do, including the agencies, right? Labels could go start agencies or management companies. Michael Rapino is all an, an AG of invested management companies and other things and venues. Uh, I know Corin Capshaw, he went and spent or, or went and invested in a lot of different um, vertical markets around touring. A lot of people have. So I, I think it's a, it, the one thing that everybody's learning through this is how complex the ecosystem is and how many pieces get affected, right? When the revenue stops and artists can't play, including even labels, right? People think labels are okay. Well, really all the indies depend on the artist touring, getting press, putting out records in order for, they don't spend that much in marketing promotion, they don't have it. So, um, and the majors, as you know, have reduced their flow of new releases infinitely because people don't want to just lose the record in a week for the most part again. So I think everything is on the table, everybody, is gonna make some choices where they think the opportunities are best and where they should invest and what they should grow. The great news, unlike past disasters, I don't know if there's ever one like this, but, but um, is that the music economy is way bigger and way more healthy than people know. So wherever you invest, you got a good chance of making money or striking gold because as you know, value of copyrights is going up. Look at the Warner IPO, Spotify price, everything in the copyright IP business is skyrocketing. Look at Merck Mercuriatus's multiples on his publishing. That world is going nuts. You read the Goldman Report, it'll tell you four to six times that you're talking a hundred billion dollar recorded music industry minimum. And then the touring industry and how vast it is, and it was just really growing, um, especially globally, you know, it's gonna go through at least a double, could be 50 billion a year, bigger than the movie business, and all the associated pieces, I think it will come back, will come back big and it'll be healthy. The question is, can people get through and then where they spend their time agencies? Yeah. Everybody can remake themselves now. Okay. Let's go into genre. You were saying that generally speaking, you are not personally into what is on the chart, so to speak. 
how strong hip hop. Which, which charts? We're talking about <laughs> the Spotify the Spotify top fifty. Which uh, yeah. okay, the Spotify top fifty, which is basically hip hop and pop. Does that do as well as the top 50 of your live? They've always been disconnected. I mean, I remember reading Polestar in the 80s and looking at Pink Floyd, The Grateful Dead, Bob Seger, you know, they weren't on any chart of recorded music ever, right? Pink Floyd, et cetera, et cetera. And the same was true later in the alt rock, you know, grunge revolution. There's a lot of it. I, Look, I think pop and ticket sales can converge and do probably more today than ever. And same with hip hop. Hip hop, it, it was part of the development period for people to really take the touring infrastructures um, and invest in it as, uh, as the rap and hip hop community grew. And that took a lot of time. I was part of it and I watched it. Um, I think the same is true for the electronic music industry. It took a while for people to really shake their metaphor of what being a DJ was and put it into a live, you know, arena or other con festival context. And I think over time, all of them grow. And that's why you have such robust business at the moment. Um, so the chart is the charts, the recorded charts are, again, not today when the touring market is shut, but it's more in line than it was in the past, in my opinion. And there's more surprises than ever because there are touring surprises that are not on the chart and there's huge recording artists that don't really affect the touring but i would say a large percentage of it the holy grail is people to switch on all the revenue streams okay and they understand what they are today so whether it is the ad rev ad share that you discounted but i think is bigger than you do or direct e-commerce or merchandise which is an all-time high publishing and syncs and you know all the different uses of publishing and, and splits and remixes and da, da da touring and all the touring besides merch, all the touring ancillaries. I think today people realize there's 10 revenue streams in the music industry. I got to turn at least six to 10 of them to, to really be in the game. So I think everybody's trying to learn. So you have history in different areas. You have history at a record company. Let's just assume there's <laughs> not my best one. It's like my okay, basket. but I'm going to give you a liberty okay. here. There okay. are three major record companies at this point in time. If mm -hmm. I were to put you in charge of one of them, forget mm -hmm. which one, mm -hmm. what would you do? <laughs> Besides take it public? Yes. Um, okay, well, that's the first thing, all right? Um, and I think that will be happening. <laughs> well, really, some... Sony is part of a uh, Sony Music is part of Sony International. Warner just went public. And uh, we'll I know, but Sony, like Sony, first... right now it used to be that you know if you were content, you were driving the machine. There's an argument to be made that Sony Music's valuation is getting crushed by being part of the bigger. Yes, play, but right? you so have I... to. But you have to assume just, that Sony I'm wants just... to own it. Okay. okay, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. I think that you know it's a separate stock. Um, Universal obviously is under Vivendi, and I think Universal at some point goes public and will be massive and good for all of them. They've done a ridiculously great job building. Look, I think record companies have the next 18 months where they have a lot more staying power. They have the market with them if you're public and a lot of capital. They could be the great consolidators right now. If I were driving one, I would be really building out my tentacles of infrastructure to have more pieces of the music industry and of a what I'll call the supply value chain. If you, if you call Spotify a pipeline and the label is oil, oil supply, I would be um, doing a lot around the oil supply and the healthy parts of the music uh, industry because I have capital, I'm flush. I can do artist help. You could buy clubs, you could be a label, you could do a lot, right? They started merch companies, they started agencies, they've invested in management companies. Uh, I know Vivendi is doing a ton in Africa. I saw a presentation that was fascinating. They're in like 15 cities in Africa. Wise or not, they're investing in the music industry infrastructure. They're a French company. There's a lot of French territories. And so it's sort of fascinating. I think they, are the, they, they have the most opportunity right now. My two yeah. cents. 
but and they one, have the publishing, so they're already covered two ways to Sunday, right? Okay, so. but what do we know about major labels today? They are releasing fewer records in fewer genres than ever before in an era where there's more music and more genres, both being distributed in that type of music selling. So they're the pausing market. the new release piece too, but remember the new release piece is the least profitable for them. So in some ways by cutting that, all right, and getting more catalog revenue as a blend, their actual profitability is gonna go up in some ways, okay? And the valuations are skyrocketing at the same time. I, I think they will be fine. I don't think that their dip is going to be bad. It's how do they invest? Let me put it slightly different way. Uh, they are missing out on genres uh, that don't do well on the Spotify top 50 because certainly you get paid on consumption. This could ultimately the, be the bane of their existence. I don't think Because so. they certainly want to take a big piece I, I, I don't agree. I think what happens is after every format change, the majors just buy up what they don't have. Historically, they've started labels, bought labels, consolidated labels. Because when there's a new profitable model and streaming's the most profitable and the best one, they just buy more of the Spotify. It's a, it's a math formula, okay? It doesn't stream as much as a hip hop record maybe or a, a pop record. But, you know, the these labels are, they have very smart people in there who know the value of an indie record, an electronic record, a hip hop, a pop record. They have a different value and multiple assigned to them. They still want to buy them. At the end of the day, the, the game is going to be buying up as much of the Spotify streaming revenue as you can get. And the majors will be able to do that. So I think that's going to be unprecedented in the next five to 10 years. Let's because they're losing market share. You know that because the exactly. Interest, right? Yeah, but they're going to buy it up, Bob. They're going to be flush with cash. Like well, a lot. You know, wait, wait, Bob, Bob, you know, $60 billion. Dollars. The Universal, I said 40. They're going to go out at 60, okay? If anybody's listening from Universal, I'm sure you'll, whatever, you'll say something. But it's going well, to be good, well, okay? We, if you have good- Wait, hold on. What yeah. do you think they could do with $5 billion of cash with Indies? Especially I during COVID. That's such Wait, a rabbit hole. No, it's let's not. leave that aside. Because let me go to a slightly different point, okay? If okay. you have incredible traction, if you're Lil Nas X, you yep. can write your ticket at the label. But if you're not someone with incredible streaming numbers, at first, the record company, the traditional label is not going to give you a good deal. Whereas you can go to direct to Spotify, the other, and get it more than 90% of the recording revenue. And yeah. someone, and someone you can also do direct deals. With Someone anybody. who's young and leverages that, why do they need the major labels? The so major labels, a great percentage of their distribution market share is based on, they distribute all okay. these little the labels. The answer is not signal, to signal to noise. You don't. First of all, you have efficient back ends and systems. If, usually because you get a cash advance because you get bought out and you don't get a cash advance otherwise. So that's the majority of why people do this, right? It's not like, they take your records out of the store and rebrand them with a label on it and sent in as a nice price that no longer happens. So nobody knows what happens because the IP stays in Spotify or Apple Music. It never changes. It's always accessible to a customer. There's no label there anyway. So it's just who gets paid? The royalties, right? That's it. It's an invisible transaction. So okay, if somebody's wait, so if somebody's gonna make a margin on it, they're gonna buy more of it. It's like factoring. So if I think that, you know, the indie label deal is this and I'm going to pay them a million dollars to take over this and I get 39 cents and my payout to them was factored at 33 cents and I make six cents, they're going to do it all day long. It's just math. Okay, let's go to the other side of the equation, the artist. Okay. Of course, there's a the decision whether to take that deal. But in the heyday of classic rock, when this business was built, artists were worried about their credibility. They did not want to do endorsements, sponsorships. There were very few privates. To what degree is that a factor next today? Uh, it feels very like an old topic from back from the 70s and 80s to me. I think that, that that ship sailed. There are a few people that still feel that way. My good friend Paul Tillett feels that way about Coachella and more power to him. Um, look, my view is this. Uh, sponsorship is one revenue stream most people can't get, Okay. It's easy to say, ooh, you're selling out. And a lot of people feel that way. I don't know what that means anymore. I mean, Trump's using people's music without authorization for his shit and artists are fucking freaking out over that. You think they should care about a commercial? They got paid for, that's much worse. So anyway, look, here's what I'd say. It's, a, it's an older overblown topic. 90% of the artists I think would take it and think it's no hit to their credibility. The truth is that 
in their Instagram feeds, there's advertising everywhere. Just like when MTV played their videos, there was ads before and afterwards. They couldn't do anything about it. The same was true on radio. The same is true on social media. And I think it's an overblown topic. Music is surrounded by advertising almost no matter what platform. Again, you know, Pandora and streaming services aside. Their concerts, they go play a venue where they don't take a sponsor and there's a spot three sponsors at the venue who the fuck knows you think the consumer's like nope that band has credibility because they're playing the chevy concert series it's not them i don't buy it i think we're way past that one sell by date sorry okay let's talk about you for so people get where you're coming from where did you grow up near you buddy stanford Connecticut. You know, i know all your history this stanford, is for connecticut going on. Stanford, Connecticut. That's right. Okay. And uh, were you the type of kid who was the straw that st uh, stirred the drink or were you a loner? What kind of kid were you? What is the straw that stirred the drink? Social? No. Yes. That's someone when uh, Reggie Jackson came to the New York Yankees, he says, I'm the straw that stirs the drink. The leader of the band, the person yeah, who makes I, things I, happen. I, I try not to have that kind of a thought about myself. I think I was a normal, you know, first generation immigrant kid who was a jock and I was uh, into music. I was, I used to call myself a geek jock because my dad was an engineer and I was pre-med and I was into genetics and immunotherapy and gene therapy. You know, I'm a bit of a geek and I'm, I'm a computer nerd. I was going to be a, a computer science minor in college. I was writing compilers. I was probably the first guy in the industry to use a computer or a spreadsheet. Most people know that. And I was one of the first people to talk about online services, the internet, what before the internet, right? When it was commercial online services. So I, I, I don't know. I'm a geek, uh, music freak, you know, jock, okay, so a normal, normal guy that doesn't, that isn't any, I, I don't want to be one of the big personalities in a perfect world. Okay. Or so, be anything. Okay. okay I know this, but for my audience, where do you go to college? UC San Diego. Why? Pre-med only. And I was going to go to Berkeley. It's where I used to buy records on Telegraph at Leopold's and Rasputin's. It was my nirvana, right? I'd be shopping for CTI jazz all the way through the latest indie, whatever. I was a freak. And um, Berkeley had a shit med school and no housing in 1980. And you had to pick three schools if you were in the UC. And I uh, looked online, saw UCSD was beautiful and had the best med school. I flew down there and it was out of control. Gorgeous. Okay, so, just to, Brett, so at, what point you do you, at what point do you move from Connecticut to San Francisco? Uh, 16, 16 Palo Alto. Okay. Junior, junior, junior year. Okay, that must have been very hard socially. No, no. I was a, I was a baseball player, so it was easy. How what good, a, you got, How good you get, a baseball you, player were you? I was pretty good. My kid's good, too. But here's the bottom line. You, you get accepted. I wasn't an outcast. Athletics or other special interests uh, – allow you acceptance in ways that, you know, the normal outcast slash, I, I don't know anybody doesn't. And, you know, I tried to be somewhat social. Okay, so to go to UCSD, how do you get involved in the music program there? That's a fun story. So, um, I had some fun, fun dorm mates, by the way. Mike Judge was a dorm mate was a, uh, at the time. So, they had a campus record store and I signed up to work at it. It started the year before. And oh, once my, again, what, once again, what year are we in? 1980. Okay. And I ended up running the record store within two months, I think maybe a month. And that was really fun. I, ha I managed a band out of the record store. I called their number on the back of the vinyl. It was called the church. Martha, excuse me. Hold on guys. Martha. So what I was, at that point, then the campus radio station came calling. I joined the campus radio station and I took that over. Um, I then joined the concert committee and that went really, really well. And I ended up promoting shows on campus and then. Oh, okay, well, a little bit slower because usually there's a hierarchy in college. You're the newbie and there's a senior. There wasn't, not, not a UCSD. Everybody, it's a nerd school. It was, Emma, you know, it, no, and I kind of, I don't, I don't want to say anything here, but let's just put it this way. I was lucky enough to have an idea of what to go do, and that led the day. So what did you say to do? Well, in the concert area, buy more shows and put on more shows, and I convinced the administration then call just didn't have fear calling agents back in the day. I remember this day calling Andy Waters on my first show and Joel Parisman on the second show I promoted and I'm trying to remember who did Spyro Gyra at the time. Paul LaMonica on B.B. King. 
you know, Joel Perisman on King Crimson, Andy Waters on Ian Hunter, and it just rolled. I, I don't even know what to say. My friends said to me, yeah, this is what you were always destined to do. Fuck that doctor shit. That was a bunch of bullshit cover for your mother. And this is what you were going to do. But I didn't know that. So it just went. And I ended up okay, having a so lot of success down there. And I was on 91X in the radio. I started Humphreys and it blew up. And I- Whoa, went, whoa, whoa, moved. a little bit yeah. slower. How many shows did you do at UCSD? Four to start, then started a company, did four more, and then got hired by what is was Avalon Attractions, Mark Berman, that then got bought and is now Live Nation. But the, And then hundreds of shows. <laughs> Junior and senior year, hundreds. Really? Hundreds. Okay, yeah, so you really. say you started Humphreys. Tell us about yeah. that. Um, it's a venue in San Diego. It's been going 30-something, 30 35, 37 years. Probably the hottest venue in San Diego, one of them. But what happened was we were – I promoted – Carla Bonoff, Bonnie Raitt, and John Anderson from Yes at the Old Globe Theaters in San Diego, and which are gorgeous, all right, 900, 1200 theaters. But they were union houses and you couldn't make any money, okay? And no, Bob, I did not charge $20 a ticket to make money on top ticket fees, but uh, you couldn't. So we were looking for a cheaper venue and I happened to go with a production manager to a radio station, um, event where they were giving out drinks and promoting some advertiser and it was at a hotel and there was they laid it out a little jazz band was playing on this lawn and i said hey i bet you this looks cheap we could do shows here and i went and met with the hotel manager and he said sure and i cut a deal with him on the spot and i think the first show we did there was david lindley and el rayo x and i think we did the crusaders and then four nights of jimmy buffett and jimmy buffett so that in 10 minutes, there were 3,000 boats trying to watch the show from next to Humphreys. And it broke and it never looked back. So, Okay, and whose money was it? It was the company I worked for at the time, which was the promoter who, part of it, before I saw soap opera, it was a partnership between a San Diego promoter named Mark Berman and Avalon Attractions. So it was both of their monies. I think Avalon was floating the cash. And Mark Berman had done some stuff in Avalon, but it wasn't nice. And Avalon said, we're going to throw you out and take our money back. So there was a big show that they uh, captured the entire box office and settled the score. And then I was asked to choose which one was I going to work for. And I, and I was still in school and Humphreys was my baby at the time. So I stayed with the Mark Berman guy for a moment. It's a whole funny story. He was funded by a drug dealer and it was just wacky. And I lasted there about another nine months. And then I made a decision to go to LA and become an agent. I was pursued. Funny story, the guys who were triad, then William Morris, Richard Rosenberg, and Peter Gross, like great guys, dear friends and great people. God rest Peter soul. Um, <laughs> I sold out a Sergio Mendez date, I think in 1983. And Richard Rosenberg is one of Sergio Mendez's best friends and Belafonte and all these people had loved Del Mar, who's a horse guy. So he would go down to Del Mar all the time. So here's his excuse. Sergio Mendes is actually selling out somewhere, which never happened. He's like, I got to meet the guy that's selling out Sergio Mendes and I got to go to Del Mar. He came down, we became friends and I went to work for him after that. And, and it's, uh, you know, that was the start of post-college. And what point do you decide you're not going to be a doctor and what do your parents say about that? Uh, she's still pissed. Um, I don't know that my parents ever figured out what I actually did or do truly, they read some press, but I don't know if they know. Um, I was really getting my ass handed to me into sophomore year in chem classes and, and down there. O-chem and P-chem were really, really hard there. And I just got killed. I was distracted. So that made, it made my choice easy. Then management science became, <laughs> came calling, which is a joke, but whatever. Okay. So, so you, move, you moved to LA, you work for Triad. It was Regency at the time, got merged into Triad. Went 84 to 91. Okay, and in 91 you go? Rick Rubin. Good story. Here's a, here's, a, here's a fun story. So 88, 89, 90, 91 were incredible years. They were all incredible years. But those were incredible. I mean, the music that was coming out, whether it was beginning of hip hop, whether it was grunge, alt rock, it didn't matter, whatever you call it, in, you know, indie, da, 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 da. But it culminated kind of in Lollapalooza and I left. And I was really upset. I got a shitty bonus one year and it really bummed me out. And then the other thing that bummed me out was product manager at Electra Records had all the say and the promotion people over the Pixies who were one of my favorites. And I was a Pixies fanatic. 
and they were putting out, I think it was Trump Le Monde, and they picked the wrong single. And you should appreciate this. UMass was the hit and they never put it out as a single. And I went crazy. I was like, the Pixies are finally going to have a huge hit. They get something they deserve in the world. And the record is going to fuck it all up because some radio program said, oh, I like the beat of this record. I was livid. So I realized right then and there between the bonus and that, I got to go in the record business. That's the power is every agents are nothing the live business on the bottom of somebody's shoe, which is no longer the case. And you've written about that too, but it was at the time. So Irving had offered a job to me and um, somebody worked with me and said, you know, instead of you being reactive, you should be proactive. You should write well, down how your- did you know, How did you know Rick Rubin? Well, I, mean, uh, I worked, I was Danzig's agent and we were friends. We were friends from before that. Um, and I wrote down my three heroes at the time in the record business. One was Ivo Watts Russell for AD, but I couldn't work for him. Um, Rick Rubin, Gary Kerr first, and Seymour Stein. And they were, when, when, when this person said, be proactive, you gotta work, you're, you're Mark Iger, you gotta, da, 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 don't take the first whatever, go work where you wanna work. And I went and met with all of them, I was, they were heroes to me. And uh, Rick felt the best and I spent five years with him that were amazing. I learned a ton, he was, he's amazing. So what'd and, you learn? Uh, too much for the podcast, but I watched him and George DeCoulias and Brendan O'Brien and Dave Sardi and all these people make records. And I didn't know how to make a record. I'm watching Rick Rubin make records. I helped them sign Johnny Cash and Mr. Fat Ali Khan. I'm the guy that flew down to sign Johnny, you know, on behalf of Rick. It's huge. <laughs> Branson, Missouri and Nashville. I mean, it's ridiculous. Chili Peppers, Blood Sugar, Sex, Ma Blood, Sugar, Sex, Magic, Wildflowers, Tom Petty, all made during that time, Mick Jagger. Plus, 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 Slayer, this, that, and the next. I signed 15 bands that I loved, all failed, but you know, not failed. Great records, Mary Chain, MC9, for Jesus, Medicine, Julian Cope, Frank Black, just artists that people didn't care about commercially, but I loved. But I learned a lot. And then I bought a couple of websites when I was with him that I had a real vision for, and he became a partner in Artist Direct. So that was kind of how So I tell started. us when Artist Direct started, what the viewpoint was and the development thereof. The viewpoint was pretty simple. It's fun. Okay, so here's a funny story. I, I saw Mark Cates is somewhere here, but um, so this is relevant. If you haven't seen the Beastie Boys documentary on Apple TV, I highly recommend it. Watch Linda Ronstadt's too. It's amazing. But the Beasties brought me back to um, a story. Ian Rogers and I met in Detroit at Pine Knob. I think it was a Beastie show wasn't Lala, it was Beastie Show. And John Silva was there and I was freaking out at that period over the internet and what it meant. And I- Just to be clear, what, what year are we in? Do you remember? 90. Good question. Whew. It was not the internet, it was commercial online services. So it must've been earlier, 92? Okay. Okay. And Ian and I were explaining the Beasties and Silva what was gonna change about the world. And fast forward, I was in the car with Rick, 94, 95, explain, maybe it was 96 when the browser came out, uh, explaining that right now, I didn't understand how, if I was a fan, and I used the Beastie Boys with Rick, obviously, because he was uh, instrumental there, um, why I have to go to a concert to buy the band's t-shirt. And why, when I want to find out what they're doing on their new album, I have to wait and buy 10 magazines to see who's going to write about them. And I want to buy, go to the record store and buy their records, but I can't buy their ticket there. I have to go somewhere else. I said, what the fuck is that? That's like the worst organization system you could even think about. It makes a scavenger hunt look good, right? Because it's random. I said, it's impossible to be a fan. What? The, terrible. So again, I've been in commercial online services, AOL, CompuServe, Prodigy, you know, Delphi. My buddy from college was one was probably number two in Silicon Valley. They made a movie about him because he was such a forward thinker uh, in terms of home automation and networking. And I said to Rick, when the browser hit, I said, the world has to be reshaped. Everybody has to go to the artist for everything. Their tickets, their t-shirts, their information, their tour dates, their music, their videos, and it should be in one place. Why do you have to fucking jump around? 
the digital, the, this internet thing is going to allow for that to happen. I want to build a company that builds the home base where everything is at. So when people go there, they get everything. It's a stupid organizational system. This is a reorg, okay, with the artist around the center. This is before the concept of commercial online streaming services, which then is a platform where you have a lot of artists, right? But then hopefully you link to these centers. Now there's multiple centers, multiple channels, but at the time it was built, trying to build the first one. So the real thought behind it was trying to centralize the artist content and their goods, right? And their information and not make it, you know, a road trip to have to figure out how to get that shit. It was, it was maddening. And, and for me, who was a super fan of indie and underground music, um, it was double bad because those artists didn't get in Rolling Stone or on MTV or on the radio. So now you had to dig and wait for, God, was it written in a musician magazine or did Option do a story or Trouser Press do something or Cream or this or that, or depending what you were doing, or, oh, I got to wait till the NME comes in three weeks late and sounds and Melody Maker to see if they write about them, right? And I'm representing New Order and the Bunnymen and, you know, Smiths for a moment and, I, Cocteau Twins and the Pixies and Dead Can Dance and nobody's, they're not on the fucking radio. K-Rock, whatever, some of them. And um, how are you going to find out about that? And then what really bothered me was I said, okay, now I'm an agent. I'm working with these bands. I'm in New York for the Bunnymen. They sell out Roseland and Radio City, 10,000 freak Bunnymen fans. And after the show's over, nobody knows who they are and how to get to them again. And I go, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my entire life. I have to fix this. This is so stupid that things with this kind of fandom where those fans would kill to have Ian McCulloch say, here's a new song or anything, right? Kill, crush. And there's no system for that. So those two thoughts is what I went to try to do. Okay. So you leave Deaf American, which becomes American at some point, what year? Right. 96, beginning in 96. 96. Right when the browser. What do, you, what do you do for cash on this startup? Started an agency. We made cash right away. Had some okay. of the biggest startups in the world. We had Chili Peppers, Rage, Pearl Jam, Bjork. You know, 96. We had a lot of Okay, was just to be clear, was the agency part of Artist Direct? Yeah, 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 yeah. The whole way. That was the concept. We didn't take financing for a year and a half. And then we raised very little. We didn't need it. And we built... I built the first system in FileMaker, e-commerce, both the booking system and the e-commerce system was built in FileMaker. I wrote it, I coded it. So we were doing FileMaker transactions and what happened, here's a funny story. So I was good friends with Norman Perry from Periscope, Vancouver promoter, great guy, hyper smart, dear friend. He went to work, I think in Toronto for Michael Cole. And then he opened up one of the merch companies called Brockham with Peter Lubin and got sold it, got pushed out, whatever, and then started a new company. And he had David Bowie, he had the Rolling Stones, you know, he had some real heavyweight folks. And he was a big friend and fan through another mutual friend, but we were dear friends, we still are to this day. And when we were opening Artist Direct, the Rolling Stones were a huge business for him, but he couldn't sell anything online and this e-commerce thing was new. And I called him up. In fact, my friend Keith said, you should call Norman and see if you can get the Stones. And I actually, the first band artist direct ever signed was the Stones, ever. Norman was like, I'm going to set you up with Mick. Bless you. You go meet with Mick if you can convince him and he's an online freak, you go. And I went and met with Mick in the Four Seasons Hotel in Beverly Hills one morning, came out in the bathrobe. He, he's the smartest motherfucker. Anyway, he understand, understood the internet. He's like, I'll give you this, but you got to get me my cricket. I want my cricket. Every city I'm in. Now, this was in 96 or 97. There's no cricket online being streamed anywhere, let alone streaming. I mean, the bandwidth was terrible. You couldn't, AOL graphics were still downloading slow, right? So forget songs. And he wanted to watch cricket everywhere he went. And he was furious that he couldn't, right? He's like, that's what the internet's going to be. Fast forward, he was right. Um, and he said, absolutely. And we built the Stone Store and it you know, did a million dollars of e-commerce pretty quickly. And then we went from there and it was a hell of a way to start. Um, sort of proved the concept, although it was early, there weren't banner ads. I mean, 
we were the very first implementation of SAP ERP system on the whole internet. <laughs> you just think about what era you were in. There was no programming languages. You couldn't program a database. Everything was in Tickle, which ran CNET, and you had to hire Tickle engineers, T-I-C-L, and there were none of them. <laughs> so it was, you know, today it's, everything's plug and play. You could do anything on multiple platforms. So it was a very different era. Okay. Now, we know the end of Artist Direct is it goes public and it goes bust. But what happens between That's signing That's a story by stone. itself. Yep. Uh, what happened? Like we built like the motherfuckers who signed 125 artists, did their websites, their e-commerce, their direct marketing, their email, you know, marketing to their fans. We ended up selling tickets. We ended up selling albums. So whether it was Beck or Cher or it didn't, you know, we worked with a number of brilliant artists. And they had records that didn't that the labels didn't want to count as commitment records so we sold them direct to fan and we'd sell 50,000 20,000 direct to fan of a record that you never heard of now this is before digital so it's still cds or what a vinyl or whatever um at the time and obviously then the file business changed things um it's kind of gone or close to gone by then but we grew we built we grew far bigger we built bigger we did more stuff um, we failed on a couple record labels, which weren't really a big part of the business. We had a couple of other websites, the ultimate band list, which was the first one, ubl.com, which was, you know, we were trying to grow the traffic, but, you know, at that point you had mp3.com, then Napster, you know, prior to that music Boulevard CD now, then the introduction of Amazon. So for historical sake, that's what you were dealing with. And nobody knew the difference between Napster and mp3.com and us or launch, poor David Goldberg. And they didn't know, and they were all radically different. And, but it was version one point of the internet with AltaVista and Ask Jeeves and Excite and Yahoo and InfoSeek and Lycos. And not many people made it past wave one. And, you know, our story was legendary because I went, we went public the week of the market crash, which was interesting and Sarbanes-Oxley. And I had to be a public company CEO for, you know, a couple of years after getting completely beaten up and not knowing what to do. So I can, I feel for public executives right now, um, you know, 20 years later, they have to face a version of a completely decimated business and market. But listen, it was the greatest learning experience of my life. So I don't know what else to say. You know, it, it happened, it's history. And we built a company, we were doing 20, $30 million in internet revenue, which, you know, in today's numbers, who knows what they'd be, mostly e-commerce. We started, we were one of the first people, Mark Weitz and a few others in the internet advertising business, people figuring out what's a banner, how does it work? What's a mouse over? What's a, you know, when flash doesn't work here, so-and-so there, you know, I think we took Lollapalooza and built one of the first websites ever for a festival. It was really fun. Remember, it's all carnival. Oh, okay, you're painting such a positive picture. Why did it fail? Ah, there's a bunch of reasons. Number one, I fucked up. Number two, 15 years early, probably for the real market. Number three, I fucked up. Number four, whoa, 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 just, it was a, not, wait, whoa, wait, wait, number what, four what was mean? a terrible market, meaning you had to, for me to be an inexperienced public company executive when the market's closed for three years with Enron and Starbucks Oxley and me trying to figure out what the fuck to do, I should have just shut down and thought about it and waited. I, it was too, when I say fucked up, Bob, it was, shit was swirling in my head. People were happy the internet was over. It wasn't, you know, it, oh, old media's C, all you young upstarts. You, you, you weren't as smart as you thought, you know, you're dealing with a lot of crap. I didn't know what to do. And I was lost. I went and met with everybody who were trying to sell their companies. I had a lot of cash. I was still lost, but I was an idiot. I should have held down my cash and just okay. got through it. Definitively, were you too early and it could never work? Or was there, you know, my mother said next time, don't wait at the bus stop, son, for 15 years, you'll do better. And I, that was a cutting fucking blow. Um, you know, I was so into being in the next system that I forgot that people have to transition into the next system. It was all about what I thought was possible, not what was going to happen, all right? Or, or consumer habits hadn't evolved, or technology hadn't been laid in, or the waves of the internet had to happen. I, I was enamored by this idea, and I just 
imagine time didn't exist and everybody was going to convert like they have today, right? So now that I'm supposed to be older and wiser, I'm definitely older, whether I'm wiser or not, it's a different story. But once you look back, hindsight being 2020, you go, schmuck, there were massive societal changes that had to take place before your vision could come through. Who the fuck are you and what were you thinking, asshole? You might, like everybody's just going to, you know, have their browsers handle this kind of ad thing, or they're going to feel comfortable with their credit cards on the internet or any of that stuff, right? Those are all hurdles that society has to get through. Or people will go to the web. There were no mobile devices. There's fucking Blackberries, right? I mean, the bricks. So, um, you know, this is the era of Palm Pilots. So I was a moron that way. And today I th try to think, ooh, Am I doing something that takes massive societal adoption? Is there technology that has to get laid in place? Ooh, do they have to lay in bandwidth for the shit to work? You know, what, like I should be the one that's out there experimenting? So that was a lot of it. The answer is, yeah, it's a schmuck. Okay. So A, when it crashes, how, how does that affect you emotionally? B, <laughs> How long, does it, how long does it take you ultimately to segue back into the business and how Three do you years. decide to go back into the agency business? Three years, I was bloodied and bankrupt and had to get a job that paid me a salary. I was paying myself 150 grand a year as a public executive because I, Don Muller and I were very worried about that, that we, were, we wanted to be looked at ethically. We're taking the public's money, investors, we weren't gonna get ourselves rich, we weren't gonna do this, do that. And I was, crushed had some kids during that time two boys and you know ah so i was going personally bankrupt you know i lost 63 million on paper and two million in cash and thank god for a couple a banker a friend of mine who basically got me credit and helped me work my way out of it and then peter grosslight hired me back I, I went to see we had sold the talent agency to caa don wanted to go he wanted to get off the scary ride <laughs> don't blame him uh, at that time and we had a great staff and most of those people went to caa and a lot of them stayed there. And the artist went, we closed that piece down and I kind of, I made a mistake and I hired Ted Field because I was beaten, I was a beaten man. And he basically turned in the label for the last gasp and it wasn't great, it was terrible actually, but whatever, it is what it is, mistakes made. And um, I put myself to bid to the agencies because they were the only people that were gonna pay me. I didn't wanna go back and be an agent. I wanted to go run a tech company, but Nobody's going to hire me to run a tech company. I just got beaten up. I, they didn't pay. It was all back end. No record label was going to have me. I was a failure there uh, and wasn't proven. Manager, I didn't have clients. I didn't really want to do that. So I had to go back to be an agent. Totally, okay. bummed, out, totally so, bummed out at the time. And Peter said, Geiger, come on back. I'll pay you. And that's what, that's what started. Okay, so that uh, episode at the agency business, which turned into WME, is now over. And needless to say, there's a little bit of a pause button, certainly in the live business. But what do you see for yourself personally going forward business-wise? Um, I'll be honest. Um, Curly. Somebody should read that comment. Damn straight. Good, good left midfielder. Sorry, I'm reading the text. Um, I think it's the best time in history to start something. So I think I'm gonna start something. I mean, listen, there were some rumors planted out there about what I was doing and this, that, and the next, they weren't true. You know, well, I never got a call from Daniel Eck. He's a friend of mine. So, uh, you know, I don't have a job to be a mocker at YouTube or Apple Music or Amazon or Spotify or any of those places and they don't, or anything close. So, if you were offered those gigs, I don't know. I don't know, but I don't have them. So it doesn't matter. And it depends what the gig is. I got inquired about a position at SoundCloud that wasn't very interesting, but still, um, there's nothing really there. There's a few other big jobs I might consider in the rest of the traditional music industry and they're not there. And, um, and that's, oh, that's okay. But the truth is when I sat out here over the last four months and thought about what made me happy, because I'm getting older, what do I want to do? Damn, I'm this old. What do I really want to do? I came to a couple fun conclusions. One is I am what I am. A, I love tech, but there's no room in tech right now. I don't see it. Everything that I talked about happened. And it's big, big. I, I've said it. You've seen my speeches. It's the big player time. You, very little room for disruption right now, okay? It's hard. Everything's being built onto the big platforms. And new media is in some way, it's not the same, becoming old media again, right? 
They just is, and it's bound to be that way. Um, systems don't change that much, even though the distribution and pricing change. Um, so I looked and I said, what turns me on other than tech and being forward is artist development and discovering music. And I'm a music freak and the underbelly of the industry, the ground up golden voice, you know, clubs, indie labels, developing artists, you know, Jensen McRae is an example, right? So that's what gets me the most excited and gives me some purpose. And I could, and, and there's some part of me, and my friends know this, and I think they're the same, that feels young by staying very current in music and the music business and tech. Okay, if you're sort of, I'm into esports, my son's in esports, I'm very on top of it, I'm deep in the digital world. So it kind of keeps you young. And so I want to stay there. So I'm probably going to just start up focused in those areas. Okay. Just looking at the business in large, once we get to the end of this pandemic, uh, what do we know? The record companies ruled until the internet. The internet came al uh, along a great percent, other than the tippity top tier of streaming artists, most artists make the majority of their income live, which has changed the paradigm in that the live business a funds these acts and B can break these acts. Do you, what do you see going forward in terms of where the power lies? Well, this is going to be not that sexy an answer. I think building an artist's career is like building a house. The reason I use the housing metaphor is because the manager is really like a general contractor to me. They have to manage the owner, i.e. the artist, right? And they have to look after all the subs, the record company, the publishing, the agency, the touring, the merchandise, the this, that, and that, you know, everything, right? The advertising, the content creation. And they have to do all those deals or manage all of those things. So I think it's similar to a GC. And then I think all of the other pieces of the building the house, i.e. The, the artist, is um, actually important. So in a weird way, you know, can the electrician do the roof and the hardscape, you know, i.e. can the promoter do this, that, and the next? Sure, in certain cases, but there's a lot of artists and there's a lot of specialized pieces to all of this. So as much as people want to label me a disruptor, I've never actually been a disruptor. I have tried to identify disruptive disruption, but from a disruptor, you either drop price or you collapse and consolidate people into or, or companies and jobs into into um you know you consolidate them uh, you disintermediate okay sorry i was searching for the word and i i actually think that when the business comes back every piece of the subcontracting universe and general contractor will be more needed than ever because every artist will be hurting for money or success every club will Every venue will, every promoter will, every agency will, every label will want to get back to where it was. And I think it will be all hands on deck and more activity than ever before. So I'm not sure that I see, there's consolidation opportunities like I talked about if Universal or Warner went on a tear and wanted to do some stuff and got really smart about it, I can see that. Um, I can see new money coming in like that real estate investor who doesn't have office buildings during the crash, but they have new capital and, and, and buying things. But I think every part of the industry is going to be vibrant. I think agents are going to be more vibrant than ever and needed. I think promoters are going to be very high on the, on the um, value chain. I think labels will continue to be high on the value chain and only increase because again, everybody wants success, Bob, and they want money. And so, yeah, there's a very powerful mental force to look at big artists and go, who works on their team? And they don't, they're not devoid of a manager or an agent or a record company. There's not that many of those stories. So I think when you look at the most successful artists in the world, it's who's on, who is their team? And I want to be with them. So I think the aspirational, you know, call it lemming theory aspiration drives 95% of the business. So I, I think every piece of the industry is going to be there and healthy and not disrupted weirdly i'm not talking about radio or okay. or record stores or those pieces which get wiped out i'm talking about professional services i, I don't see it 
I think it actually got more complex. I don't think promoters know how to break you worldwide for the most part. Live Nation and AG are a little different. They are worldwide and they have tentacles. They can keep them for the most part and, and with good players. So they are as close and the labels have similar. They are as close to filled out networks as, as you can find. Now, whether they give a fuck about your little artist or not and would give you the, you know, this is where the theory is different when you're acting for a superstar than for anybody else, but there you go. Okay, forgetting the pandemic, what advice- yeah, how, you, how do you do that? Sorry. It's not that hard when the question is ultimately revealed. Okay, fine. What, what advice would you give to a new artist today? Just starting out. Number one, make a lot of content. I mean, the one thing I would say to artists starting out or not is right now, okay, here's a left set. You know, back in the day, the Rolling Stones made three albums a year. The Beatles made three albums a year. The Beach Boys made three, whatever. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Two albums with a minimum relief, Steely Dan. I remember we went on a Steely Dan listening binge. The first three albums came out in like a year and a half. It was crazy, right? And they were genius. So you sit there and go, what the fuck? Weren't they touring? Oh yeah, they actually, well, Steely Dan didn't, but for the most part, they did actually. Um, I had no idea Michael McDonald was in Steely Dan. I just learned that. And Jeff Baxter. And that's how they do. Really well, Jeff do. Baxter was a regular member. You know, Michael McDonald got credit. Uh, yes. More than you think. But anyway, pre-doobies. Anyway, I think artists should do that again right now. Right. Create. I think the, the elongation of the marketing period where you can tour the world for two or three years, you know, and not put out a record and come back and then have to spend a year making a record, the cycle's too long. So I think the number one thing people need to do is make a lot of content right now. I don't care what it is, but store it up for winter and don't release it all. Because the distribution systems give you credit for constantly releasing, whether it's YouTube or Spotify, the way the new releases are set up, the way the playlists work, you know, you have your one week to one month honeymoon period and, if, and then it's gone. It's up in the Library of Congress on the 40th floor. Nobody knew you wrote the book. So... To me, it is, okay, how do I switch? I may still put out albums, maybe it's the end of whatever, but how do I consistently work the system the way the system works, which is have new releases on a constant basis? So that's my answer. Okay, and what advice would you give to someone, once again, forgetting the pandemic disruption, what advice would you give to someone wanting to get into the music business? <laughs> Not the greatest time, um, look, there's so many people that are getting laid off by the music business. Yeah, but forget it's... about it. Let's just... Uh, okay, 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 okay. I got it, I got it, I got it. I, gotta, I, gotta, I won't get there. I just, just, right now is a, just, I can't. It's a shit time. Um, manage a band. No barrier to entry. I mean, you want to learn how to build a house? Start on the smallest house and build it. Figure out how to, you know, that'd be one thing. You know, there's no getting on the radio, you know, put together playlists for your friends. Uh, but managing bands is the lowest barrier to entry, if you think about it. You can't get a job at a record company or an agency. It's not that easy. You can, by the way, you can join it. Agencies were an easy point of entry. You'd go in the mail room. Uh, go be somebody's assistant that you respect um, and write them a personal note. Do some research. You know, the biggest thing I found about young people is they don't do much research. I read everything. I read every Rolling Stone guide cover to cover 15 times, trouser press guide 15 times, option magazine, fucking print was six point font and I would read option magazine reviews if you remember Scott Becker. And every bit of it, I was just a freak. I'd listen to everything. I, the way I used to sign artists, I'd go to England, I'd talk to, and talk to the indie label head and they would say to me, wow, you know more about my artists and my label than I do. And you're a kid from America, right? So do your research figure out who's your favorite write them a note nobody ever does that there's a lot of ways to enter but find somebody and, and manage them mark this has been wonderful thanks so much for your insight my pleasure till next time this has been the bob left sets podcast um, See you, bob. hey gentlemen let me say thank you to you both that was amazing mark you are the smartest guy in the room and you proved it and i really appreciate your friendship and your mentorship and all that wisdom bob you are a masterful interviewer and you both are welcome back on our stage anytime speaking of our stage uh, we're having another program this thursday and that features jim griffin and kelly richards so tune in 
uh, same time, 2 p.m. Eastern, and we look forward to seeing you all then. Above all else, stay safe and healthy and wear one of these. It's not hard. Thank you, folks. Be safe. Okay. Uh, Mark, stay on with Doug. He is going to tell you how to transfer the file to him. Uh, I think we've covered it because I got to sign off and transfer my file to Doug. So thanks, everybody. Been great. Bob, is that right? Okay.